All right, well, hi everyone. My name is Jason and I am a postdoc at the University of Michigan. Um, having said that, I am physically in Sydney, Australia right now. Uh, so that means that there's a very good chance that while you're watching this, I am enjoying being asleep. Um, Romtin, thanks for inviting me to give this asynchronous talk. Um, I guess what we're going to be focusing on today is uh, how we can take lessons from deep learning in order to train spiking neural networks. Now, I can appreciate that not everyone might know what a spiking neural network is and how it differs from a conventional neural network. So we can tackle this kind of like a tutorial. Uh, and I'll leave a few of our, our really interesting results um, that we've generated to the very end. Right. So a lot of uh, questions in neuromorphic computing arise when we compare the brain versus deep learning and the backpropagation algorithm, because neural networks trained with deep learning, they're currently the state of the art in a lot of machine learning or data-driven applications. Um, a lot of high dimensional data sets in natural language processing and computer vision have all been kind of obliterated by the backprop algorithm. Uh, but then there is a bit of a limitation to all of this. Now you see GPT-3, if you're not familiar with it, it's an incredible language model um, developed by DeepMind a year ago. That costs 12 million US dollars, right? Just to train uh, in, power, in, in terms of the uh, power consumption, in terms of the power bill that they had to pay. Um, it clearly exceeds what the brain requires by, by uh, many, many orders of magnitude, right? Now, if we were to instead train the brain on the world's most powerful supercomputer or the Fugaku supercomputer, uh, we can approximate uh, the brain to have, say, 86 billion neurons, uh, each of those with a fan out of, could be anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 synapses. So we've kind of uh, found an average of 7,000 synapses for each, each neuron. And we want to update our system at a millisecond uh, precision, so 1,000 updates per second. So if we multiply that out, then we need a system that can operate on 600 petaflops. So 600 times 10 to, I think, the 15 uh, floating point operations per second, right? Now, the world's most powerful supercomputer here, the Fugaku, can run 442 petaflops, and that's going to cost 30 megawatts to do so. So there's a little bit of a disparity there. Uh, especially when you account for the fact that the brain only needs something like 12 watts, uh, whatever energy it takes to light a light bulb. So why not take the best of both worlds? Why not take biologically plausible neural networks um, or those that can, uh, neurons that can spike in, in the brain and merge them with the performance uh, of the backpropagation algorithm, right? That's the direction that I've taken. There is, of course, a, a complementary direction where we are, uh, where we extract, the, I suppose, the brain's algorithm, such as heavy and plasticity um, and all the variants of that, like spike timing dependent plasticity, STDP, uh, and trying to train a neural network using that. But yeah, I'm focusing on how can we make a network functional? And we know that the backprop algorithm already works, so let's use that instead. Uh, and one observation that we should make here as well is that with the brain, the neural circuit the neural circuit that makes up the brain is also the neural algorithm, right? And so we're not quite there yet in hardware. We're not quite sure how we can take or how, how we can take a map of the brain uh, and put that into hardware, partly because our technology isn't there, but also because we don't really have a map of the brain. Uh, so, so we are quite a fair distance away from here. So instead, that, that's why my goal is purely in functionality. I want to try and make spiking neural networks uh, competitive with conventional uh, neural networks here. Uh, before we get there, let's ask why. So what's so good about the brain? And I think I can distill this down into what I've called the three S's, right? So firstly, spikes. Biological neurons interact via single bit spikes. Um, and if you kind of think about it, a, a neuron here, there's an illustration of a neuron where you've got the neuron body, uh, you've got all of the inputs, which are made up of the dendritic tree, um, where 
the output of the neuron is generally perceived to be the axon. And along that axon is where you generate an, an action potential, right? So if, if, a, if I was to take a, an electrode, if I was an experimentalist and I, and I probed the brain and I put the electrode with a lot of high precision onto different parts of this neuron, let's say I probed the membrane here, right? What I would see is a fluctuation of voltage. I would see uh, jumps and I would see decays. Uh, I, I would see noise. I would see a lot of ups and downs. But if I took that electrode, I moved it, let's say more than one millimeter away from the soma, from the neuron body, I took it one millimeter away, then I wouldn't actually detect any of that anymore. All of that noise would be attenuated. All I would detect is either the axon at rest where there is simply no activity, no electrical activity, or if the neuron was to be excited, I would measure this action potential, this sudden jump in, uh, in voltage, right? And so neurons communicate with each other using action potentials. And in terms of, uh, of, of electrical activity, this in digital circuits, this makes a lot of sense because um, we can represent that spike, that event as a one. Uh, if in neural coding studies, we approximate that, uh, that action potential uh, to a single one because we don't really care about the amplitude or the, the width of the action potential. I mean, they're all more or less the same uh, with small variations, but in general, we only care about the fact that an action potential occurred. We don't care about the finer details. So whenever that action potential occurs, we represent that with a one. And otherwise we say that there's just zeros or the neuron is quiet. Now, in terms of a circuit, in terms of a microprocessor, this is really nice because if we take ones and zeros and load them up onto a chip, operating on them is incredibly easy, especially when you compare that to high precision or floating point values, right? Because if I take a zero and I multiply it by a weight or a, or a parameter, then my output is just zero, right? Whereas if I take a one and I multiply it by that same parameter, um, then my output is just that parameter, right? So either I pass a zero or I'm doing a single memory readout. Um, so there's no uh, carry propagation delay from multiplications. So it's, it's all a very, it's a simple process, right? And another really nice advantage here is that we're leaving all of that noise or that neuron body perturbation, uh, we're leaving that to occur locally within the neuron body. But the moment we're looking at communication from neuron to neuron, that's when we move into this digital spike zero one domain. So layer to layer communication, uh, which is conventionally quite an expensive task, has now been constrained to only communicating ones and zeros rather than 32 bit or floating point values. So in terms of a circuit, spikes uh, have, have a lot of advantages there. Now, the second uh, S that I want to talk about is sparsity. Now, biological neurons spend most of their time at rest, setting most activations to be zero at any given time, right? Uh, and I think I depicted, I illustrated that uh, in the previous slide. But just to drive that point home, uh, if I take this vector, or this list of zeros and sevens, it's incredibly inefficient for me to read it out, right? If I say zero, 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 blah, 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 seven, that's, there's a lot of redund redundancy there. It's far more efficient for me to describe it by saying we have a seven at position 10 and a five at position 20, right? Condense down that ex explanation. Now, the advantage of this data structure is that Memory is only going to increase as the number of non-zero elements increases. So that's another really nice computational advantage of how neurons uh, communicate, of how neurons signal to each other. And I suppose the final advantage that I wanna talk about is static suppression, also known as event-driven processing. So the sensory periphery, so our eyes, our nose, and our skin, et cetera, they only process information when there is new information to process. Um, so if you think about it, this scene here, the scene that our retina is currently witnessing, 
we're suppressing all of this static background input. Any information that is unchanging is kind of stored there in memory and our retina is able to be extremely efficient by only processing change. Uh, and so we can represent that uh, computationally in, this, in the form of a sparse tensor uh, filled with zeros wherever there's static input and we replace our dynamic information, any information that is in motion with a one, right? And uh, this is a sample taken from a what's called a dynamic vision sensor um, or a silicon retina, um, which might make more sense if I show you a video here. But if, uh, if I film some motion using this event-driven camera, uh, what's really nice is that every pixel is asynchronous, right? Every pixel is operating independently of one another, um, only firing whenever there is a change. And because of that, it means that most of your pixels, uh, for, for, for a majority of the time, they're actually quiet, they're, they're not firing. And by removing this global shutter that uh, wants to read out an image uh, at 25 frames per second or whatever, whatever frame rate you've got, instead of activating every pixel periodically by, by keeping pixels quiet, you end up using far less power in a dynamic vision sensor when compared to a standard CMOS imager. And that lower power means that you can, I guess, buy more clock speed and get a higher, uh, higher uh, speed out of, your, uh, out of your imager, which leads to this slow motion microsecond temporal resolution in this dynamic vision sensor. So that's a really nice advantage uh, in terms of latency that also translates across to processing, to event-driven computation. Um, so with that being said, I think that spikes are great. There's, there's a lot of uh, potential benefit that we can extract and apply them to neural networks. So with that, with that said, let's take a look at how people are using spikes to actually train neural networks. Um, and, and perhaps the most common or uh, well-established or mature methods is to simply take an artificial neural network, train that, and then through some other optimization procedure, convert it into a spiking neural network. So what's, so what's good about that? Well, it's firstly the uh, state of the art uh, in most complex tasks using spiking neural networks. So if I want a really deep network, then this is probably going to work quite nicely for me. Now, there's a group at ETH Zurich uh, led by Shi Chi Liu, uh, who reported a 20 layer autoencoder structure at ISCAS to perform video segmentation, which is really nice. Um, and I suppose the reason that they're able to do that is because all of the benefits, all of the research that's being poured into training deep learning models can now be directly translated across to spiking neural nets. So that's good. And in that way, in that same way, training very deep networks is made extremely simple. Some of the drawbacks, however, well, firstly, the spiking neural network is necessarily an approximation of your artificial neural network. If you're converting from one to the other, then you lose something. You're approximating uh, your, ori your original form. Uh, and also temporal neural network conversion is thoroughly underexplored. So we're not really taking, we're not really exploiting the temporal advantage of spiking, neuro, uh, of spiking neurons. Um, I mean, what I mean by that is, uh, is that the brain is this online learning uh, machine when every, every neuron uh, is for most of time, it's going to be quiet, only spiking when there's, uh, when there's change. So, so neurons are temporally dynamic and this conversion approach just doesn't take advantage of that. So that's a relatively underexplored area. Um, and finally, it's also quite biologically implausible. Uh, it's not something that our brains do. We don't, we don't train a shadow network and convert that, right? Um, but also that doesn't concern me as much because again, my, my key goal here is to make something useful. Um, I'm not too concerned with biological plausibility, although that is a really interesting uh, line of research that, which is uh, worth looking into. But there's a plenty of online tools and resources that help uh, achieve this. 
um, such as the SNN toolbox, which was released by Bodo, also from ETH about four years ago, which, and, and it still holds up today, which in deep learning years, I think four years could translate to like 40, 40 years. Wow. So it's, it's quite a testament to how, how good a tool this is and how, how functional uh, this approach is. So even though the training process might be quite inefficient, once you've got that spiking neural network, then during feed forward, you're able to extract all of that uh, power benefit and all the energy efficiency. The approach that I'm a little more interested in, what I've kind of spent a lot of my time on is, uh, is natively training a spiking neural network, right? And using back propagation on that, uh, on that system itself. So in that regard, you're no longer bound by the upper limit of artificial neural network performance. Um, biological plausibility depends on the learning rules. So I guess you've got biologically plausible algorithms like STDP and unsupervised approaches, which are incredibly efficient uh, and they're deeply fascinating, but they really struggle the moment you take it to a complex data-driven task. So although backpropagation and gradient descent are made up of many constituent steps and made up of iterative application of the chain rule, um, and it relies on, an, uh, on a global loss function that is very handcrafted, uh, people often perceive backprop to be very implausible in that sense. Um, there are arguments that say that the brain implements approximations of gradient descent, and they're quite cool to look into. But there are potential ways to massage backpropagation into something that could be feasibly run in the brain. So if I take my input, pass it through an, through an SNN, through my, through my spiking neural network, and I generate an output, uh, I apply the backprop algorithm. An alternative approach is to actually just feed back my output back to the input, right? Uh, and so ideas of predictive coding, uh, where there could be a, a difference between my brain's expectation and uh, reality, where if those two things don't match, only then do we update our belief. And so by traversing the error signal back to the input, um, it's, still a, it's still something that can be used to train your network uh, using something like forward mode or uh, differentiation rather than what backprop typically does in reverse mode differentiation. Um, now, a few of the disadvantages of natively training backprop. Well, firstly, it's not so efficient on modern hardware. Like the backprop algorithm is fairly, it's, it's relatively complicated uh, when you compare it to feed forward processing. And in a more practical sense, if you were to train a, if, if you were to train a spiking neural network yourself, you would see that it's actually very sensitive to all of your hyperparameters. So we want to try and kind of fix that up. Now, to address this, uh, I finally got to use the graphic design classes that I took in high school. They finally paid off and I, I've designed uh, SNN Torch, a gradient-based learning framework uh, with spiking neural networks. It's an open source project on GitHub. Uh, the URL is here. If you want to avoid writing my convoluted surname, then you can just Google SNN Torch and the relevant results will surely come up. So it's a Python package dedicated to gradient-based optimization of spiking neural networks. Um, and in our pursuit to perhaps do something uh, that the brain does in, in trying to make backpropagation kind of match with what might take place in the brain, I've designed several online learning mechanisms so that you can, you can let your network learn and run in real time. Um, and it's seamlessly integrated with PyTorch, hence the name Torch, if you didn't pick up on that, uh, which means that it's, of course, CUDA accelerated. But we've also taken a few uh, little tricks in order to make it lightweight enough for a CPU. So quite often you might run into memory errors because when you're simulating long time steps uh, in a spiking neural network, all of those time steps, all of those sequences simply can't fit into eight gigabytes of memory on a GPU. So we've come up with a lot of tricks to help make this, I guess, possible. So it's all quite nice. Now, I'll, I'll go into how that might be useful for training neural networks in a bit. But before we get there, I want to discuss what does it mean for input 
for, for spike-based input to be passed to a spiking neural network. I think, I think it makes sense to start with the input. Now our sensors, our, our eyes and our, I'd like all of our uh, sensory periphery is taking in analog information um, from the world around us, converting it into spikes and passing that to the brain. Now, the way that our, our sensors are converting it into spikes has been the source of a lot of debates, a lot of arguments between the rate code community and the temporal code community. So it's this kind of almost pointless argument that I think is important to go into um, to get a bit of a feel for, I guess, what's out there. So rate codes refer to this idea that information is stored in the spike count or the firing rate. Now, the fire, that, that's a very simplified definition, but the point is that some bit, if, if, if your input has a high intensity, perhaps that's a very bright pixel, then the frequency of a, a firing is going to be much higher. Meanwhile, you have a temporal code where information is stored in the timing of a spike. So rather than distributing information across multiple spikes, all we care about is the timing of one single spike. Um, again, if, if we had a very bright pixel, that would mean that you get a very quick early spike. If it's a very dark pixel, um, that might be converted into a, into a late spike, or perhaps it never even, your neuron never even fires. So there's a really cool paper by Bruno Olshausen uh, titled, What is the other 85% of V1 doing? And by power and metabolism uh, arguments, he conjectures that 85% of the brain must necessarily be using a temporal code. Because if, if information was encoded in multiple spikes, then that would just burn through all of the energy available to us. Our heads would literally fry because of the heating that would take place. So uh, temporal codes seem to be uh, the dominant mechanism within the brain. Um, but there are some caveats to that. When, when we translate this over to a neural network, um, you'll find that a neuron will typically only learn as long as it's firing, right? A neuron will only learn if it's generating spikes. Um, and that kind of matches a lot of the theories of underlying heavy and plasticity. Um, neurons that fire together, wire together. So if they're not firing, then they're not wiring in a sense. So. With that being said, rates are typically better for error and noise tolerance. Um, and because they allow an error signal to back propagate through a network, they also enable faster convergence when relying on the back propagation algorithm. Meanwhile, temporal codes are sure they're more biologically plausible, uh, but they're also far better for power efficiency and latency. Um, so of course there's a bit of a trade-off here, just, just like anything else. Um, now we've also got spike encoding at the output. So that handles what might be seen at the input. What do we do with the output? How do we train our network in order to generate output spikes? And what do those output spikes mean? Um, so just for example, perhaps we project this uh, number seven from the MNIST data set into our, into our network. Uh, we repeatedly sample it across time. And at our output layer, we have several neurons, for MNIST, we would have 10 output neurons. Let's just say that this highlighted one, uh, this orange one, uh, neuron is the correct class. If we were to train our network on a, on a rate code, then we would run our network for X time steps. We would count up the number of spikes from each of these neurons and effectively measure the frequency or the average frequency for all of time from each neuron. And we would expect that this orange, this orange highlighted neuron has the highest frequency. And that would correspond to, I suppose, the correct class of neuron, whereas a latency code would only care about which neuron uh, fires first. Um, so that orange neuron should fire before all of the other neurons, right? So there is a bit of a dichotomy between input encoding and output encoding. Like I could have a rate coded input matched with a network that is temporally trained. So people e quite easily trip up on this concept, but yeah, the input and output kind of need to be segregated um, in order to uh, decide what you want your network to do. So I mean, just as a bit of a visual example, if I take this static MNIST sample, uh, I convert it into a spike train. 
then I count up the number of spikes. So this is a fairly poorly trained network. Um, but over time, which is on the x-axis and uh, our output labels from zero to nine on the y-axis, uh, you see that the number three uh, is actually is firing the most frequently. So this is a rate coded uh, network. Um, clearly the number five, I guess the network thinks that, hey, this number three kind of looks like the number five. Um, the, the neuron corresponding to five is also firing quite regularly. So you can imagine that the noise tolerance from a rate code is being exploited here in a sense by, because we have many spikes coming out, that allows the number three to, to uh, take a lot of time to, to tell us that, hey, I am the number three. Like the, this, this, this picture is uh, what I correspond to. Whereas if we use the temporal code, even if the number three fired the most frequently, there's a very reasonable chance that the, the fifth neuron could fire first and then we would be wrong. So uh, temporal codes are not as error tolerant as rate codes, but still it depends on what your ultimate goal is, right? So that's with respect to our inputs and our outputs and what we're trying to get the network to do. But then how do we generate a spike? What does it mean for a neuron to be a spiking neuron? And we can consider it like this. If, if we have a neuron, we've got our neuron body and we excite it using spikes, um, I suppose that if this neuron is sufficiently excited, then it triggers, a, then it triggers its own output spike. Right, um, and because these spikes are very unlikely, because they're sparse, they're very unlikely to all arrive in precise uh, unison. Right, so that suggests that that there must be some sort of temporal, um, uh, some sort of sustained temporal uh, delay. Right, when a spike comes in at some time, the neuron kind of remembers that for a short period of time and it integrates the effects of, of a distributed number of neurons. So how does that work? How does that operate? Well, this can be traced back to the uh, leaky integrate and fine neuron model, uh, which was kind of, I, I suppose it can be traced back to 1907 where Louis Lepic uh, in France, he, he was running simulations uh, extracellularly on a frog uh, muscle, on, the, on, the, on the, the fiber of a frog's leg, right? He was probing it with a hacked together current source and um, he would assess, he would gauge how long it took for the, for the leg to twitch in response to current pulses of varying lengths and durations. Um, and so he came to the conclusion that this, uh, this um, neuron actually looks a lot like an RC circuit. So how does that work? Well, if you think about the physiological structure of a neuron, we have the neuron body, right? Uh, the neuron body is surrounded by an extracellular medium with a lot of ions, a lot of sodium ions, and it protects an intracellular medium, which also has a lot of ions, or I think a lot of potassium ions amongst many others. Um, and so you've got this insulator, this thin bilipid film that protects the that protects a conductive outside with a conductive inside. And so what do you get when you have a, a conductive material with an insulator and another conductive material, it's basically a capacitor, right? And this membrane is modulating the, the flow of ions into and out of the neuron. Uh, and so that's considered to be some sort of ion leakage. And if you have leakage of charge, then I guess that can be modeled using a resistor. So you've got a capacitor and you have a resistor. Um, and so that is what leads you to this uh, sort of simple leaky integrate and fire neuron. And if, uh, if I was to be Louis Lepic here, injecting my current source, I would, I guess, model that with, uh, with IN. So let's, uh, let's take a few, uh, I guess, artificial uh, emulations of how the neuron will respond. So if I have a step current uh, at the input of this RC circuit, then just qualitatively for now, my membrane potential, Vmem, is going to exponentially relax to a steady state value that equals R multiplied by C. Now, if I was to clip my input, then suppose the, the, X, the initial exponential relaxation is causal. It's going to stay the same. And so that's going to approach uh, the same way that it did before. And it will decay with, an, uh, with a time constant of RC. Now, if I was to deliver the same amount of charge in a shorter period of time, then my input rise time would be much faster and my decay 
would just be RC, it would be the same. And I can keep repeating this experiment um, in, a, and approach the limit of this Dirac Delta, which isn't physically possible, but it makes sense if you were to integrate uh, the current input, because then you have a finite amount of charge delivered to this RC circuit, in which case you have a, a, a non-physical instantaneous jump in membrane potential followed by a decay, right? So that's what the RC circuit looks like um, in terms of a, of a spiking neuron. So if I was to input a series of spikes or perhaps a spike train, then that's going to look something like this. So it's going to each spike, each, uh, the onset of a single spike is going to be integrated and it's going to decay. So that's our, that's our integrate and that's our leaky. So we've got this membrane that's leaking charge uh, back to its uh, resting potential. Now, to make this compatible with a neural network, we need to discretize uh, our membrane evolution, right? Uh, sequential neural networks have discrete time steps, so it makes sense to discretize uh, what we see. And we can do that quite easily by modeling, uh, our, modeling it as a recursive equation where the membrane potential at present time t is simply the previous time of, uh, of voltage multiplied by some decay rate beta, which is like a function of RC, of, of our resistance and capacitor. Uh, and that's going to be summed with our input current injection, right? So up until this sudden jump, uh, our membrane potential is zero, but then that current is added and then it decays over time. Now we've got the leaky, we've got the integrate. How about the fire? Well, uh, simply implemented using a thresholding mechanism, where if we, we were to do the same thing, we apply a spike train, then our membrane potential is integrated. And the moment it hits the threshold, we get an output spike. And then at the same time, then the membrane potential will reset and I guess re, uh, and repeat the process. So we kind of encapsulate that into our leaky integrate and fire neuron. And effectively what we do is replace every instantiation of an artificial neuron model with this spiking neuron. Right. So if you want to visualize it in, in an alternative way, then as a recurrent neuron, then uh, we take an input current, uh, convert it into a potential, which is scaled by beta. And then at the next time step, we apply our next current input and see, has it, has it uh, exceeded the threshold here, which is represented by the uh, subscript THR. Uh, pass it through a heavy side step function where if the membrane is greater than the threshold, then you trigger a spike. If it's below the threshold, then it's just zero. Uh, and if not, then you just decay it and you keep on doing that. Now, we can represent this in an alternative form as an unrolled computational graph. Um, I guess I've got snn.leaky just to indicate the syntax that would be used in SNN torch. Uh, but yeah, at time equals zero, we take our input current pass it through our membrane potential. And in the absence of any further input, it's simply going to decay uh, with beta, beta, beta. And perhaps you have sufficient input here to finally trigger a spike at t equals three. So just hypothetically. Uh, but of course, because this is a neural network, we're trying to learn something. And what, what needs learning? Well, you've got a parameter w, which is linear. It's a, an affine transformation of some input x, right? So our goal is to generate some error signal and find the optimal value of W. And in a recurrent network, all of these values of W are shared. So it's equal over all of time. And all we do is perform an update or perform back propagation uh, at the very end of our simulation. So we're trying to generate an, an, a, a global error function, some, some sort of objective. Uh, and I guess I'll try to be quick about this, um, but we have many options of how to, how to um, train our spiking neural network. So for example, a cross entropy uh, to the output spike rate where we say that perhaps this neuron is the correct class uh, and these two neurons are incorrect classes in a supervised learning algorithm. Uh, and hypothetically, let's say this guy is spiking five, as it spikes five times over the full simulation, whereas these are two and three respectively. Now, 
the cross entropy rate is going to try and maximize the correct class and minimize the incorrect classes, right? Uh, an alternative method is to use the mean square error count loss where you set a target spike count for correct and incorrect class. So for example, perhaps I want my correct class to spike four times and perhaps I want my incorrect classes to spike twice. In that case, I guess this neuron one is going to be happy, doesn't contribute to the error signal at all. Uh, whereas this is going to be suppressed just a little bit. So why might we do that? Why might we want incorrect neurons to fire a little bit? Um, well, in terms of backpropagation, uh, I previously alluded to the fact that if there's no spiking, then you run into the risk of no more learning taking place. And so even if your incorrect classes fire at least a couple of times, um, or I guess how many ever times relative to your full uh, simulation run, then you at least promote error back propagation and some learning can continue to take place. Now with the mean square error membrane loss, we're kind of cheating here now, instead of looking at the spikes, we instead look into the hidden state, which is perceived to be an, a, a, a non-observable variable. Um, but we're trying to specify what the membrane potential might be. And you, know, you can apply conventional regularization techniques as well here. So in that case, if we're able to get a loss function, uh, we're happy with that, but we actually want to perform back propagation through time. Um, and so here I've depicted um, the back propagation pathway that your loss will take where you just kind of iteratively apply the chain rule here. Um, and I've said that the, the derivative of the loss with respect to some weight, which is, I guess your input multiplied by your weight gives your current is going to be a function of all of these terms, right? If, if we only consider one single time step and say that time step is uh, t equals three, then our gradient is going to be a function of that. Why is it a function? Because the, the total error is, or the total gradient is actually going to be a summation of all of your pathways. So everything from t equals two, everything from t equals one, everything from t equals zero, and not just that, but also the, the pathways that go back in time. And I guess in this picture, we have three of those, but you can imagine that through multiple layers and multiple neurons, that's going to scale uh, quite rapidly. But if we get an understanding of what each of these terms mean, uh, then I think we can start to generalize into how this will uh, scale to something a little bit larger. So this, uh, this first term, dl on ds, that's an analytical equation. All it takes is summing up spikes or you know, doing some playing some tricks. And so getting the derivative of the loss with respect to your spikes is an analytical, it's an analytical problem and quite easy to address. Um, this voltage and current relationship is linear. I mean, we're directly adding this current uh, to the voltage. And so that evaluates to one, right? That's quite simple. Uh, DI on DW, well, to obtain your current, you simply, you simply multiply your input X by W, by your weight. So again, that's also, uh, that evaluates to X, uh, your input spike, and it's very easy to address. The one term that gives us a lot of grief here is DS on DV. Why is that? Well, the transfer function from your membrane potential to your spike is the heavy side uh, function. Now, if your membrane exceeds the threshold, you get a spike. Uh, if it does not exceed the threshold, then you do not get a spike. If we take the derivative of that, you get the Dirac delta function. And so that's going to be zero every, almost everywhere, except for the threshold where it's infinity. So all, what you're doing is basically multiplying all of these terms by zero for most of your time uh, and otherwise infinity. And so you're losing the a meaningful error signal uh, and therefore your weight update will almost always be zero as well. So that's the non-differentiability problem of, um, of spiking neurons. So how do we do that? How do we perform gradient descent through these non-differentiable spikes? Um, now, if we implement this naively, then it's not compatible with the back propagation algorithm. And so we've got a couple of methods to address this that I'll go through. The first option is to use surrogate gradients um, where during your forward pass, you do everything as I've explained with the heavy side function, but on the backward pass, you apply a surrogate gradient. You effectively smooth out your um, heavy side step to a, perhaps a sigmoid or a double exponential function. Um, and that actually gets really nice results. And it can be kind of likened to quantization aware training 
where your feed forward pass is quantized uh, weights or quantized activations and your backward pass is high precision. And that allows you to train uh, really good neural nets on resource constrained hardware. The alternative method that I've uh, spent a bit of time devising uh, separates up the two regions of the spike. And I guess that there's a, a nice analogy that can be made with the max pooling operator. So let's say that we have an, an input matrix, A, B, C, D, perhaps A has the highest value of the lot. The max pooling operator is going to operate on that and it's going to zero out all of the, uh, all of the values that are smaller than A. And then A is all that gets passed. In a similar sense, I suppose, when you're, when you're back propagating through that, the gradient of A is going to be one because you're taking A, you multiply it by one, and whereas B, C, and D are multiplied by zero. So the gradient there is, I guess, zeroed out. They, they, the smaller numbers do not contribute to your output. In a similar way, the spike operator uh, does that with a spike, right? If you take one, in, in the regime of spiking where your membrane is greater than your threshold, then I guess your input membrane, which let, let, let's say that our threshold is one, which is commonly done just to normalize uh, your network, to normalize your neurons, then your membrane one, in order to generate a spike, is just multiplied by one in order to get you your output, your, your spiking output of one. Uh, if my membrane is sub-threshold, let's say 0 0.5 or just any value less than one, then that membrane is multiplied by zero to give me zero. So the, I guess the derivative of the spike there is simply one if my membrane is greater than the threshold or zero if it's below the threshold. Now, that sounds all well and good. Like, why haven't people been doing that? Uh, it's because this is also an approximation. So firstly, I'm treating the operator as independent of the input, as in whatever I'm multiplying my membrane by is also a function of the input in a similar way to the max pooling operator. Um, and secondly, the maximum membrane potential uh, is treated to be the voltage. So I mean, even if my membrane potential was to exceed the threshold, I would still treat it as uh, the, the operator to be one. But this is actually a really nice result because what we're saying is that the approximate derivative uh, is one if it's greater than the threshold and zero if it's less than the threshold, which is a precisely equal to the occurrence of a spike. It's, it's one if it's greater, uh, it, it, you're calculating your gradient at the same time as your forward pass. And so that's really memory efficient um, or computationally efficient, but it's also memory efficient because now you've got the sparse matrix or the sparse vector of ones and zeros, dominantly zeros. So you're replacing a floating point uh, vector with I suppose a, a single bit sparse uh, vector, which is, which is really beneficial. Um, now, practically it actually results in a very odd trade-off between the dead neuron problem, which arises because of, uh, of uh, we're still multiplying many of our derivatives by zero. So again, if there's no spiking, then there's very little learning taking place. Uh, but we're also alleviating, so yeah, the dead neuron problem has not been addressed here, but we do partially address the vanishing gradient issue. Because if you think about it, this derivative uh, very tightly resembles the derivative of the ReLU activation function. Um, and that basically replaced sigmoid and tan H activations because um, sigmoid would result as, as your input would uh, go towards positive infinity and minus infinity, the gradient of your sigmoid tends towards zero. And then you would get vanishing gradients in deeper networks, whereas ReLU does not suffer from that. So we address vanishing gradient at the expense of the dead neuron problem. Um, but what we ended up doing was uh, to, if you think about it, if you have a network and many of your neurons are perhaps not learning anything, then what's the easiest way to address that? Like the first thing that came to my mind was to simply increase the capacity of your network, introduce more neurons, and perhaps some of, even if it's only 10% of your total neurons learning anything, then I guess you can just expand your network by 10 times and see if you get equivalent results and then prune those neurons away at the very end. So we tested this out on a, just a simple, uh, fully connected network with one hidden layer. Um, and on the right-hand column, we've got the current state of the art using similar or comparable architectures on the MNIST, fashion MNIST and neuromorphic MNIST data sets. And I guess in all cases, uh, we were able to get competitive or better results than current state of the art. Um, in the case of neuromorphic MNIST, 
basically comparable. I've, I've, th th these are averaged across five trials, and so the, the variance is fairly uh, robust as well. Now, spike op is the gradient that I've described to you. The stochastic spike operator is everything I've described to you, but with noise uh, injection if the neuron is quiet. Leaky spike operator is kind of like the re uh, leaky ReLU activation, where rather than a zero gradient, you have a small leakage, uh, perhaps 0 0.1 or 0 0.2. And we did a parameter sweep on these things. And what we found was that the stochastic spike operator loved to inject noise in later layers. So here we had one hidden layer and then a final output layer. The output layer always loved to have some sort of leakage or some sort of noise, whereas earlier layers were, were not so interested in having, uh, in having that noise injection. Um, and the hypothesis there is that well, if you apply noise or if you apply some sort of signal or bias into the uh, later layers, then that allows uh, some sort of error signal to back propagate back to the start. Whereas if I clip the gradient at the very end of my network, then you're going to send a zero back to early layers. And so um, these results actually kind of make good sense. Anyway, uh, we've kind of discussed how to perform spatial uh, backpropagation, but yeah, we also want to backprop through time. Um, and so the temporal connections also have a well-defined gradient. Uh, if I go from du t plus one to du uh, at present time, that uh, is simply, the derivative is simply beta, right? And so the further back in time you go, the, uh, the smaller your error signal uh, becomes, right? And so I guess other papers might use kernel-based methods, which smooth out that uh, leaky integrate and fire relationship. Um, but yeah, another method that we've implemented into SNN Torch is, I guess, real-time recurrent learning, where you're able to perform weight updates at the same time as uh, your forward propagation, uh, as, as you move forward in time. And uh, likewise, we've come up with methods that kind of push the gradient forward into future time steps. And again, we get equivalent performance to standard back propagation just without having to store memory um, throughout all of time or without having to unroll a computation graph. Uh, so just to wrap things up, I suppose, uh, I guess I wanna look at a performance evaluation on a meaningful task. Um, and we've published this uh, fairly recently in uh, IEEE transactions on biomedical circuits and systems, um, where we tested out um, this method using a blend, uh, using a multimodal data set consisting of, uh, I guess, hand gestures recorded from a conventional camera and an event-based camera. Um, at the same time, uh, a, a group from ETH were able to extract EMG electromyography signals um, from the arm, from the from the hand making that gesture. And we trained several networks, uh, both on spiking and non-spiking, uh, in order to assess how well they performed uh, against each other. So in terms of accuracy, the spiking neural network, which converted the EMG signals into spikes and used the dynamic vision sensing input, uh, outperformed the artificial neural network uh, quite consistently. Now, that's actually kind of surprising because it's fairly rare to see SNNs outperform ANNs, uh, in terms of accuracy at least. But my hypothesis here is that spikes are kind of like a unified currency where um, all of your multimodal input data are naturally normalized into the same uh, into the same unit of computation. Now, of course, perhaps with more research and normalization techniques, uh, you'd be able to get your artificial neural network to also match the SNNs. Um, in terms of energy and delay, well, the spiking neural network kind of unsurprisingly surpassed the NVIDIA Jetson Nano, which is processing an 8-bit, uh, using 8-bit computations by, I guess, an order of, uh, by two to three orders of magnitude on uh, an academic uh, research SNN chip called Morph IC developed by Charlotte Frankel uh, and also on Intel's neuromorphic Lowicki chip. So I guess it's kind of, un it's quite uncontroversial as to spiking neural networks ability in the energy domain. Um, I guess just to give a bit of context to all of this, what got me onto spiking neural nets? Uh, well, I guess originally I'm a chip designer by training, working on memristors. And so if any of you are familiar, I was doing a lot of work on, I guess, bit line current summation techniques uh, and trying to figure out how to optimize these circuits. So I guess if you're accumulating, if, you, if you're doing matrix vector multiplications um, using analog or high precision signals, 
well, you've got to inevitably turn that analog current into something digital, into a digital voltage that the rest of your circuit can make sense of. And to do that, you use high precision ADCs, analog to digital converters. And so all of the benefits that we were seeing by using Memristor arrays um, was actually largely offset by these ADCs. So just for a bit of a, I guess something uh, quantitative, the ADCs were occupying 80% of chip space and 90% of the total power consumption. And it was a highly noise prone uh, circuit. So a lot of these benefits derived from RM are just totally offset. So instead, if we do uh, spike-based processing, then I conjecture that resistive RAM is far better suited for that. Um, spikes are digitally represented by pulses. So we're uh, still multiplying our inputs by our weights, but we get rid of current summation and we can replace all of your ADCs just with current sense amplifiers instead, which is quite nice. Um, so if you, if you want to dive into, a, into spiking new, uh, neural networks and training them a little bit deeper, then I've got some tutorials online. I guess you could just find that quite easily by typing in SNN Torch tutorials. Um, I'd like to thank uh, several people here, including my supervisor, Wei Lu, and as well as contributors to the SNN Torch repository. Um, and this project was, uh, SNN Torch was supported by the Ada Center and the Forest Research Foundation. Uh, so I guess that because I'm probably asleep right now, if you have any questions, you can either direct them to Ramtin who can pass them on to me or feel free to email me at jasonesh at umich.edu. Uh, you can check out the SNN Torch project online. Uh, a lot of interactive tutorials, which are, make things quite, uh, quite intuitive as well. So yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Have a, have a good weekend.